I'm glad everybody's here today. It's a beautiful day outside. It's a nice, sunny, mild, nice day. A good day to go for an extra mile out on the road. Young Josh was here when he saw that picture earlier, and he says, oh, we're all going to go out and run another mile? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah, you can go run an extra mile. You and Tawny can go run. <laughs> it's just like... I have run. I do run occasionally, but you know that's that's for young people. No, not really. Like Tony, <laughs> so running those extra miles. Anyway, we're going to talk about what it is that Jesus said when he said, "Go the extra mile." That's the way we prayer phrase it today in English, but you know he he said it a little bit differently. But we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I want to put it into a little bit of context first, and you may think at first, well, what's that story got to do with what Jesus said? I think it'll be clear as we go along. But I want to tell you a story about my, my father when he, in the 1940s, when he went to take his driver's test. Remember, they didn't really have driver's ed back then the way they do now and stuff like that. And he went to do his driver's test. And the first time he went in, he went and he drove the way they did it out in the country, you know, and stuff. And the way his older brothers drove, you make a left-hand turn, you start over here in the right lane, and you kind of cut across and cut the corner as short as you can. So you go across the wrong lanes to go across. And he, he failed. You know, and they sent him home. Learn how to drive right before you come back again. So, he, you know, he says, oh, you're not supposed to turn a left turn that way? Well, that's the way we always did it out in the country, you know. Yeah, you know, they lived outside town, just outside of town. If you know Munster, you know where the the park is in Munster. Um, on the north side of that, my dad bought that bottom land where the creek goes through from his father, and so that's where my parents built a house when I was in high school, right across from the park. Uh, and then the farm was up the hill and just to the west of town. And you could see town from up on top. The, the house was way up on the quarter mile up the hill. It was up there. And you could see the whole territory. Great view. Anyway, that's where they lived. And so he went in to take his next driver's test. And he's taking the driver test and doing the thing. And the, and the, the tester, whoever it was at the time, asked him, what does a yellow light mean? Go faster. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Fail. Go back. Try again. You come back another time when you learn how to drive. <clears throat> and, well, that's how he had learned it from his older brothers, you know. <laughs> Go faster. Get through the light. Uh, that's, of course, not what the light means. It means stop. For those of y'all who don't stop at yellow lights, it means stop. Come to a stop. <laughs> Vicky's up here going, it means go faster. <laughs> no, it means stop. Anyway, the idea is, is he did it. Now, you got to remember, these older brothers, you know, these you know, people who went off to you know, World War II and stuff like that, you know, and, you know, one was in the Ardennes in the Army and the one was in the Navy in the South Pacific and the other one was a glider pilot getting ready for Normandy until his eyes went bad. But, you know, th this is the kind of people he's learning to drive from, you know, they were a little edgy sometimes. But the, the, the idea is, oh, well, this is like my, my grandmother, she's driving from town, going back out to the farm. And, and back in the day, there was a, this overpass that went over the Katy Railroad over there. It's not there anymore, but it was an overpass that went over top of the railroad, so the highway didn't, you didn't have to stop for the train on the highway. And she's going over this overpass, and she meets two of those sons of hers. You know, you know there were multiple but you know, they're driving my dad's older brothers, and one of them's driving his motorcycle. He's got his goggles on, no helmet, he's got his goggles, driving the motorcycle, and the other one's air surfing on the back of the motorcycle like this as they're driving into town over the overpass as she watches her <laughs> crazy kids go this way. Anyway, <laughs> my dad was a little milder than most of his siblings, but the, the idea is, what does that have to do with going an extra mile? Well, what was Jesus talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he was dealing with this thing about the um, uh, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. 
Why did that have to do with what I just said? What, what is Jesus really getting at? You know, if you go look at Bible commentaries, most of them kind of skip over this or they lump it in with the other stuff around it and says, hey, just basically be nice and put up with other people that cause you trouble. <laughs> you know, and <clears throat> that's kind of the way they blow it off. And we think about a lot of times, that, oh, my relatives, my husband, I go the extra mile for this guy, you know, I'm putting up with him all the time, you know. You know, it's, it's like you're, we're dealing with people, putting up with people. That's the way we think about it in the modern world. But Jesus had something a little bigger than that in mind. And while that is true, that we need to deal with people and, you know, be patient, put up with things, and don't take insults and stuff, there's, there's more to it than that. Now, this idea of forcing somebody to carry your stuff... You know, that's what Jesus is talking about here. The Roman soldiers could commandeer somebody to carry their gear, but the law limited it to carry it for one mile. Okay? That was, it, was, it was a Roman law, you know? And then they'd commandeer somebody else to carry it. It's kind of like when, they, when Jesus couldn't carry the cross anymore, you know, because of the beating he had taken and stuff. The soldiers commandeered Simon and Cyrene to carry the cross for him. And same idea, force them into servitude, unpaid, by the way, of course, servitude. And so this is something that was going on. But a lot of people think that this was something that Rome did or the soldiers did on their own. It's, no, not at all. This is something that was written into the legal code, and it, it predates the Romans. It goes back to, at least to the Persian Empire and probably back to the Babylonians. They say probably because they know that the word that's used in the Greek language for the Bible goes back, trace it back, they trace it back to the Persians. It's, it's a Persian word and probably the Babylonians before that. But it was limited by their laws also. But it was about commandeering subjugated people to do work for the empire. Now, the Israelites did the same thing. They did the same thing. Solomon, and it's not just Solomon, but Solomon, you know, went in. And if you look at 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, chapter 2, all right. And then Solomon counted all the resident aliens who were in the land of Israel after the census of them that David, his father, had taken. And there he found 153,600 resident aliens. Okay. Now, if you have read the story of the conquest of the land and stuff like that, you know that they didn't kick everybody out when they took the promised land and stuff. And David took a lot of territory and conquered it, but he subjugated the people that were there that were not Jewish. This is, this is just the way society was those days. There's nothing unique or different about Israel like that. You know, <clears throat> all those empires did this same kind of thing. Anyway, they figured out how many people are living here that are not part of our uh, ethnic heritage. And then he said, you know, he said 70,000 of them he assigned to bear burdens, 80,000 to quarry in the hill country, and 3,600 as overseers to make the people work. In other words, they were taskmasters, just like when the Israelites were in Egypt. They had a new uh, Egyptian ruler, a pharaoh. And um, the new dynasty came to power while they, they were there, you know, and they subjugated the Israelites there in Egypt to make bricks, right, for the cities and the pyramids and stuff. And it's the same concept now. Solomon's doing the same thing. To build the temple, he put these people to work, right? And the word there that, uh, that, that, that about make the people work, the word there in Hebrew is the same word, same root word from which we get the Hebrew word for slave, ebed. Okay, except that's avad. They changed the vowels in the thing to make it a thing where you're working or serving and stuff. But it is unpaid service to the realm, to the king, right? And so you're doing this work and it's, you know, you're commandeered to do this. And so if we go back to the thing about the thing about what Jesus said, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Now, why in the world is our Lord and Master, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, turning everything that the world understood on its head? Because people are like, why should I do that? 
Why should I give extra and do extra? Think about it this way. You know on your tax forms, there, you, know, you, can, I mean, you can give extra money to the federal government to pay off the debt, right? Like it'll make a difference. Like they'll stop spending it, right? We, we pay off that debt. <laughs> hey, thanks. Give us more money. We'll spend it. We know better than you how to spend your money, right? Think about how many months out of the year do you have to work to pay your taxes each year? At least through April, right? Not just federal. I mean, all your taxes, you know, sales tax, this tax, that tax, tax on your tires, tax on the gasoline, blah, 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 right? There's a lot of tax on gas, by the way, and cigarettes and everything, you know, all these other things. So are you working for yourself or are you working to go a mile for the federal government, right, so that they get it? It's unpaid service to the king, to the realm, if you look at it that way. But the idea is you're going a mile, and Jesus said, go an extra mile. Now, I think this is metaphorical in that he's talking about do it well. Don't go halfway. When you are doing something, you as believers, his people, his disciples, the people who follow Jesus, you do it in an exemplary manner. You need to be the model citizens of the world. I think that that's where he's going with this. And you can see that in other parts of Scripture. But... The idea here is, is that we have the idea that this was something that was done in history. There's nothing unusual about it. We live in a different world, a different culture now. We just pay and render that to the king, render to Caesar in a different way than they did then. Okay. Now, I, I always, I found this interesting when I was reading it. You know, when you read out loud, you see things differently, the scripture. But I look at it and go, I'm thinking, why did they, in the Bible, in the English Standard Version, why did they write this thing where they have 70,000 written out and then 80,000 and 360,000 in numbers? And then I'm like, oh, proper English says you're not supposed to start a sentence with a numeral, right? You've got to write out the number, right? And I was like, oh, okay. You know, and I know you all are thinking, oh, this, this is too geeky and dweeby. You know, to, to, to he's talking about numbers again. But the idea is, is that there are a lot of people that he's putting to work to build this temple. Plus, he's paying Hiram and Tyre for a bunch of people to fell trees and do other things and ship them down to him to build this temple. There are many, many thousands of people building this temple. Right. They didn't all work at the same time. They would basically be in shifts and they would rotate them through, just like David had set up the singers and the cantors and the priests to, you know, 26 different or 20, I'm sorry, I think it was 22, 24, whatever it is, sets of priests to rotate through, you know, for a service. So he would rotate them through the, um, the time to do this. So they weren't working as slaves full time. They were just doing it part time. In the Middle Ages in Europe, it was the same kind of thing, right? If, if you, uh, most people were farmers, <clears throat> you know, some were, you know, artisans and stuff. But most of the time, most people, the serfs, they worked their own land. Then they worked for their liege lord, you know, whoever that they were subject to, you know, the baron or the, the knight or whatever. They would worked their land. And then they would worked the church's land. And, you know, I mean, they... <laughs> You know, you got this much time to work for yourself, but you had to spend your time working on all these other people's stuff because you were in submission to authority, and that's the way the system when their day worked. But Christianity, Paul's letters, the New Testament says that believers need to be in submission to the rulers and authorities of their society. And I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking about back to that thing about my dad saying, you know, with the traffic thing, go faster. And I'm thinking, how many of us, even in little things like that, are not submissive to the rules? Because traffic rules, why are they there? They're there for the general welfare of the population, to protect people, right? You know, you text while you drive, 
You're going to kill somebody sooner or later. You're going to have a collision. You're going to have an accident. It, it's, not, it's not smart. It's not good. It's not safe. Although everybody does it, right? Is there anybody in here who's never texted anything when they've been driving? Oh, Tim. Okay, good. I'm glad you can set an example for the rest of me. <laughs> okay. All right. So, but the deal is, but the rules like that are set up for the general welfare of everybody. So if we cut the rules short, ignore the rules and stuff, we're putting the society at risk, the general people, other people. In other words, Jesus is saying, you're doing this for somebody else. Think about other people when you go the extra mile. Okay, and so do it well. Do the right thing the right way. You know, and I'm not going to ask how many people cheat on their taxes or kind of fudge things or whatever. That's just, you know, Jesus... Jesus, Christianity would fudge on, would frown all that fudging on the thing, because righteousness is righteousness. Unrighteousness is unrighteous, right? Now, some of y'all are thinking, yeah, well, some of those rules are just wrong. Okay, then work to get them changed, right? Well, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but the idea is, is that in general, the idea is that Christians should be the most correct model citizens that there are. Except for certain circumstances that we'll see in a second. But the idea is to be obedient and be ready for every good service. You know, follow the law, do the wrong right thing. Now, now, some people may be thinking, we don't want to be legalistic. Oh, works righteousness. This isn't about works righteousness. You're not earning your way into heaven. Jesus is talking about how to be a good witness in the society and the world. Some of the laziest people I saw at work were Christians because they thought they were entitled. God's blessed me, so I show up at work, sort of. Right? That's not the way Jesus calls us to live. He calls us to be ready for good work, to speak evil to no one. You know, I used to say, you know, the... You know, years ago, there was this group of believers at the church that we used to, when we lived in, in Louisville. And they would complain about how the other party would run down their candidate or the people who were in office and stuff like that. And then as soon as, you know, I had a new election and the other party came into power, they did the same thing. They were sending out emails, forwarding this about how everything was evil and wrong and insulting type, degrading stuff. I said, stop sending me this stuff. This isn't even rational discussion. This is just, you're just being rude, insulting. You know, the idea is we can be dis disagree on topics without being evil and disagreeable, without being like what you see in TV and the politicians. We can do what's right in a nice way, in a decent way. It doesn't mean you always agree. You know, it's kind of like Calvin goes down to Austin and he's trying to work at getting stuff changed and dealt with in Austin. That takes a lot of work. Anybody that's run for office or held a political office, you know that it is a tough job to be in politics, you know, and being on a school board and stuff like that. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody thinks they, you should do things the way they think it should be done. You know, even though you have lots of constituents who have all these divergent opinions. You know, I, you all, some of y'all have heard me say this before. You know, everybody has an opinion, right? If you want to count, if you want to know how many opinions are in the room, you count the number of people in the room, then you multiply by the square root of two. Why do you do the square root of two? Because it's an irrational number of opinions. And some of the opinions are totally irrational, right? And some of y'all are like, I don't know what he was saying. Okay, the square root of two is an irrational number. Okay, for those that don't, it, you, okay, you know, math people. Okay, Vicki, don't look at me that way. Go with the flow. <laughs> it's an irrational number because people don't always have the same opinion. <laughs> Vicki is like, okay. All right, I'm going to hear about this after church, I know. Anyway, so the deal is, but people see things differently, and they don't always see the right thing. 
Sometimes we see things the right way and sometimes we've been taught the wrong things. Just like my dad with his learning to drive. It's not that he didn't mean well, it's just that he had been taught and had always heard the wrong things. And so there are people out there that they're living the best they can, but they've only learned something the wrong way. And so when we deal with people, we have to deal with them in a rational and good and polite manner. So the Word of God says it's to be gentle and to show courtesy toward all people, even the people who have political opinions that we don't like. Right? I mean, that's, that's part of what the Word of God is talking about. And so we need to learn how to deal with people the right way. And that's not always easy. And so the situation is that there are times when we have to act differently. Okay, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great theologian, very famous worldwide back in the 30s, you know, predates most of us what he was doing. But the idea is, is that he accomplished a lot of things theologically. Okay, this guy got his doctorate. And, you know, his biblical studies and stuff when he was 21 years old. I mean, he, he was out there. He was shaping the world theologically. And he died in the concentration camp just a few days before the end of the war. The Nazis were wiping out everybody. You know, his brother-in-law, a brother of his, you know, and a bunch of other people. They were involved in a plot to kill Hitler, all right? didn't ever come to fruition, of course, their attempt, you know, but when somebody else tried to kill Hitler, this stuff became discovered and, you know, they ended up dying for their plot. But the bottom line is, is that why would somebody who was very big in following Jesus in God's way and becoming conformed to the image of Christ, and his big emphasis was is that the only way to follow Jesus to live the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount, that's really how we should live. And then he's involved in a plot to kill the leader of his nation. Why? Because there comes a time when you follow God and your country is wrong. But in general, God has established authority and structure. But there are times, like in the book of Acts, in chapter 5, uh, where the apostles had been warned not to preach in the name of Jesus, but they're doing it anyway. And so they've been put in jail. The angel comes, lets them out of jail. They go into the temple, and they're preaching again. And so now this is the context of where this is in the book of Acts. And so they got brought in to see that this is Sanhedrin into the council. And they'd been preaching the word of God in the morning in the temple. And when they came in, they got set before the council, and the high priest questioned them. Now, the high priest is a Sadducee. He doesn't believe in all this stuff they're teaching. It's not just about Jesus, but, you know, they're proclaiming the resurrection of the dead, you know, life after death, spiritual things and stuff like that. And the Sadducees didn't accept those things. It's amazing that they could be a priest of God and not accept those things, but they didn't. Uh, they were quite legalistic. Anyway, the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name. That is the name of Jesus. And yet you, here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Now, you notice that they were the cause of Jesus' death, the high priests, right? And the, and the other priestly family. They were the ones who turned him over to the Romans and got out of jealousy to have him executed. But see, it wasn't us. The Romans did it. It's not, blood's not on us. And it exactly was on them. But they're saying, hey, you guys are trying to make us look bad. You ever been at work in corporate America and people are mad because you're making us look bad or politicians, they get upset. When you come in to speak your piece at a board meeting, school board or whatever, and they're mad at you because you're making us look bad. Our decision, you're, you're questioning our decision or whatever it might be. 
You're making us look bad. That's what's going on here in this context, right? The apostles are preaching Jesus, and the, the, the people in power say, you're making us look bad. You're challenging us. And Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. Or men, it says they're plural. But the issue is, is that there comes a time when you have to challenge and go against your leadership and your government when they are pushing you to deny God and to live a way that's not godly. You push back. Jesus isn't saying in the Sermon on the Mount to just give in to them on anything. He's saying, be a model citizen. But at the same time, there comes a time when you don't do what government says to do. There comes a time when you stand up and say, enough of the stupid stuff is enough. We're not going to do that anymore. All right? Now, okay, so at the risk of getting kicked off of certain social media things, on that camera over there, right? All right, you know, some of you all have heard about the Bud Light thing. Okay? All right. Even if, even if I did like beer, which I don't, okay, I'm not getting down on beer. That's not the issue here. I can't, you know, it has wheat in it, and I can't, even if I wanted to, I couldn't, right? Make me sick, you know, you know, has, has gluten in it. Anyway, the issue is that they hired this guy, woman, whatever, let's change everything, pretend we are what we're not kind of guy, and their sales, have, Bud Light, have just plummeted. Right, and if you go watch the social media, there's people taking uh, 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 what is those road compactor things with the big uh, thing you know, where they flatten out the highway, you know, and they're taking cases of beer and putting them on and smashing them and blowing up the beer, sh machine guns shooting through cases of beer and blowing them up, you know, because they're protesting who they have advertising the beer. Right, and they say we're not buying this anymore. We're not putting up with the social agenda anymore from these things. You know, I mean, you know, what kind of marketing person just turns off your target market like that? That's just crazy. They deserve exactly what they get to go into financial problems because their sales have plummeted for doing this social agenda. <clears throat> but at the same time. Nike hired the same person who has no natural breasts to advertise their jaw bras. It's stupid. I mean, I mean, but women haven't stopped buying them. Oh, it must be okay. Oh, you get a clue. Ladies, stop buying when stuff when they advertise with these kind of people. But the issue is Oil of Olay hired somebody to do that. And that was like you hire some young, biologically male person who pretends to be female to advertise oil of Olay online. <laughs> what kind of idiot stuff is this? You know, <clears throat> I have an opinion. Yes, I'm sorry. This is not, I'm not teaching Bible stuff here other than the idea that do what God says is right as opposed to what society says is right. And that's where I'm going with that example. <clears throat> but the idea, and I'm sure we'll get some feedback about me being the way I am, but that's okay sooner or later. And so the issue is that we need to do what God calls us to do. God calls us to be model citizens. God calls us to do what he says, even when that's in conflict with being a model citizen. So there's no one thing here. We have to live under the guidance of God, and the Holy Spirit tells us what to do and what to progress on and how to act. And so we don't disobey the law just because we don't like it. We disobey the law when it conflicts with God's law. Yeah. right? And so if you don't, at least we live in a society that's free enough that you can be engaged to work at changing the laws, you know, 
That, that's a good thing. That's positive. That's better than living in some places where you have no voice at all in the law. Right? We need to be able to be able to get engaged and do what needs to be done and what's right. I encourage people, you know, if God's speaking to your heart to be engaged in a political system, get engaged in a political system. You can at least write a check, you know, to somebody and help them with their campaign. You know, even if you're not making phone calls, even if you're not showing up to school board meetings, even if you're not writing letters and stuff, you know, you can at least write a check. That's okay. That's godly. You know, because you're engaged with making things progress in the right direction for the things. But, so, you see, so if we go back, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. But when the time comes, Peter and the apostles answer, we must obey God rather than men. But Jesus said, when the Roman soldier asks you to carry their stuff, go two miles instead of just one. Relieve somebody else of the burden. But now you're going to get their attention and you go, why are you doing this? Because my Lord Jesus said to do it out of love for other people. You're going to blow somebody's mind when you do the right thing the right way better than anybody else around you. And in the book of Romans, which is really where we're going, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. They may have been instituted by God, but sometimes those people go astray. Sometimes evil gets involved, even though it's a legitimate government. And so, there comes a time when you have to obey God, not men. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. This goes back to that same thing that I've said many times before. It isn't that when we sin and fall short, we lose our salvation and, and at all. That's not where I'm going. Where I'm going is, is that when we do the wrong thing or do the right thing for the wrong reasons, we're going to have consequences. And that's what this is talking about, to you know, incur judgment, right? When you go off and, oh, um, text while you should be driving. Pay attention to your driving, but I'm texting, right? Sooner or later, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have an accident, Right? And is that judgment? Well, that falls under the, the concept of judgment in that there's consequences to doing things, doing risky things, right? So, but rulers are not a terror to good, but to bad. Would you have no fear of he who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. See, Jesus said, go the extra mile. Paul is saying, these people who are doing this in authority over you, they're doing it for your good in general, even though it isn't always easy. Sometimes we don't understand God's divine decisions. But Jesus said, Go that first mile, and we don't even understand always what that first means to go the first mile, let alone the second mile. But I'm going to maintain is to live in society to such an ex way that you're just the model citizen for everyone around you. You know, you know, you get. Have you ever been in the situation where you get called teacher's pet? No, nobody in here has ever been teacher's pet. Tawny calls me teacher's pet all the time. Okay. You, you do well be, just because you're teacher's pet. No, I am not teacher's pet. Do you know how many hours I spent working on school in these term papers? And she, she's, she's going through my stuff and she, says, and she finds like 10 grammatical errors and da 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 da. 
I said, it's already been graded. <laughs> and I've already got an A. <laughs> That's because your teacher's pet. She likes you. <laughs> okay, so why? But the bottom line is, the, teach, the, the professor, she's grading it on the content. She's focused on the content. Okay. Yeah, she realizes, okay, I have some grammar issues. I'm grammar challenged. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, Tony was correct. There were errors. And so my prof I told my professor, and she says, well, you know, lesson learned is let your wife review your papers before you turn them in. <laughs> I'm too prideful for that. <laughs> I can't let that happen. Because <laughs> then she'd change it. <laughs> but the deal is, the authority is there for our good, right? Receive the approval for God's servant. The government is God's servant to provide for the common welfare of the people. God loves people. He's concerned. And so we need to continue to follow God. But like I said, sometimes government is all doofed up. And sometimes if we do wrong, we need to be af afraid of government because the sword has its authority. The sword being the symbol of authority. You don't hold the sword in vain. Okay? And God uses government to avenge wrong. That's why when we forgive people for doing something, it isn't about their left off the hook. Jesus, I mean, yeah, well, Jesus, God said, that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, and I shall repay. God repays people who harm us. He deals with them. Okay, because the Word of God says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, and anybody that harms my temple, you know, He's going to avenge that. But it's God's position to do that. And He uses government to do that at times. That's why if somebody commits a crime and we say we forgive them, they're not left off the hook. You're forgiving them doesn't mean you shouldn't turn them into the authorities. They shouldn't be arrested. They should still go to trial. They should still be punished by government for, for crimes, right? Don't confuse forgiveness, which means I'm letting go of it. I'm not going to take the vengeance. I'm letting go of it. It's with the thing that God has instituted government to deal with those problems, okay? When wrong is done, when evil is done, when crime is done, it needs to be avenged, and that's what government is for. That's why we are submissive to government, because they're supposed to do that. And we need to be in subjection, need to be subject. People, people tend to hate this thing, uh, be submissive, be in subjection to. They think that there's something wrong with that, because I have rights. No. When you don't understand submission in God's terms, it means that you're trying to put yourself on the throne and it's all about me. I'm above everybody else. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. All right? He came as the suffering servant. The way to be great in the kingdom of God is to be the servant of all. That's what Jesus said. Okay? And so the idea is we're sub we need to be in submission to government and authority until the point where they are trying to say godliness is wrong. That's when we rebel and push back. Not just because we don't like something. Right? Okay? I don't like that yellow light. I'm going to ignore it. No. You need to follow that for the welfare of other people, even if you're not worried about yourself. I don't text when I'm driving because it's not just as dangerous for me, it's harmful for other people, right? And so that's why in some locations, you have an accident, the police have a right to demand your phone. And they're gonna find out whether you've been texting or not while you were driving on those timestamps, right? It's law. 
So, so it may not be scriptural, but don't text and drive, okay? It's not safe, all right? I remember my boss used to send me texts. She was on the, the <laughs> she's on the five out in California, it's going nowhere. I said, <laughs> you're going to get hurt. You're having a, we're not moving. I can text. Well, <laughs> I'm moving. <laughs> okay. I've done it on 380, you know, not texting, but I'm in meetings. So I have my personal phone in one ear and I have my work phone in the other ear. I have two phone calls going on while we're driving down 380, heading home. Boy, that was stupid. <laughs> you know, but I was doing it routinely because you got to be in two meetings at once and I need to get home for this or that, you know, and, you know, that little old red pickup's all bent up, but it, you know, it's got that five-speed transmission. You're doing this, stop and go. Was that a good idea? No. You know, I'm looking back on it. I'm just telling you the truth. The issue here is, is that we need to think about other people. Our actions impact others. Sooner or later, God's grace is always there. But sooner or later, something's going to happen when we do the wrong things, even for the right reasons. Okay, God's wrath is all but for the sake of conscience. For the sake of conscience, okay, we're doing it because we got to be concerned about other people. And that's also why we pay taxes, right? The authorities are ministers of God. And you think your taxes are onerous now. We, we live in such luxury compared to most countries, right? Think about the people in the, the day that Paul is writing to and that Jesus was speaking to. You think that they had a tax burden? They had a huge tax burden in comparison, right? You know, they didn't have a lot, most of them. But you pay taxes because the government is carrying out God's plan until they get to the point where they deny God. And then you got to push back. So, Scripture says, to pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Oh my goodness. Pay to what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. While I disagree with a lot of the people in Washington, D.C., they still, by virtue of the position they hold, as president, vice president, secretary of whatever, they deserve respect and honor for the position that they hold. I can disagree with all of their policies. It's kind of like the idea of loving the sinner but hating the sin that people like to say. It's the same idea. What is being done is wrong. Let's work to change it. Get involved with the political system. Change it if you don't like it. If you feel it's fighting against God, push back and deal with it. But do it in a way that God has called us to do it. And the reason I'm bringing this slide up again from Titus is because of the first thing. Titus, uh, Paul wrote this to Titus, who is the minister in Crete who's carrying the voice of God in the island of Crete, remind people to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling and to be gentle and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. I maintain that's the concept that Jesus is talking about when we go the extra mile. Okay? You can carry this stuff one mile. Do better. Go the extra mile to be gentle and show perfect courtesy toward all people. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. And we're going to pray. Now, if there's something other than you think I'm such a doof about things, that's okay. You can feel that way. That's all right. You know, um, but about the numbers and the, you know, grading the papers and all that. That's all okay. The issue here is, is there's something that's come to your mind that God has put on your mind about texting and driving <laughs> or how you've been dealing with people 
or cheating on your taxes or whatever it might be. If God's put that on your mind, I want you to take that to God right now. Say, God, what do I do about this? How do we address this? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. I thank you for some of the best people in the whole world being here at Cross Timbers Church. You have blessed this church with so many good people. People who want to follow you. People who love our Lord. People who have set their minds on the things of the Spirit that want to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I thank you for that, Lord God. I pray that you reveal to us how you want us to live, how you want us to do things differently. How do you want us to unlearn the things that we've learned incorrectly? Like my dad would turn in the corner because he learned it wrong. Or the idea of what the yellow traffic light is for because he was taught the wrong thing. Lord God, there's some things in our lives that we've been taught by society or well-meaning Christians that just don't line up with your word. And we want to line up with the word of God because you've called us to a higher standard, Lord Jesus. I pray that we be conformed into your image and we live up to your standard and live your way. Oh, Lord, these things that have come to our mind, I pray that you touch them. I pray that you help us to be conformed into your image so we can be like you, Jesus. Help us to understand your words in our context today, how they apply to us today. Lord Jesus, we, we put everything before you. We take off our crowns of authority. We step down from our throne. We get off our high horse and we bow before you, Lord Jesus because you are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. You are the creator of the universe. And by you, all things hold together. And we acknowledge who you are. And we acknowledge who we are in submission to you. I thank you, Jesus, that you are our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to pray a scriptural blessing on us, and then we will be dismissed. We will be dismissed. I ask that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Somebody has mentioned this morning that they, were, they stopped praying for patience 40 years ago. Uh, that, that could be just about anybody in this room, right? You know, but the idea is I, I, that just jumped out at, to me that we be strengthened with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Patience with joy because we're filled with the knowledge of His will and spiritual wisdom and understanding. We don't have to pray for patience because then we get all kinds of opportunities to learn patience that we don't like. But the idea is that when we be filled with the Spirit and the knowledge of His will. It changes us, and that patience grows in us without our effort to do it. Anyway, you all be blessed. Have a great day. Be ready to go an extra mile, and have a fun week. <laughs>